So, hi, I'm uh, Robin, uh, and today I'm going to talk about some of the uh, networks that were built and managed by Lancaster Uni networking team during the uh, 2000s. Um, and as a disclaimer, I do now work for a separate company. Um, while we're still based on the uni campus, um, I'm not speaking on behalf of the university or the two councils involved in the network today, I'm just speaking on behalf of myself, so before someone rings me and shouts at me. Um, so at the time, Barry Ford was head of, the, head of the technical services group at Lancaster University, and I'm sure you'll now recognise the name. He now architects Barn, um, Broadband for the Rural North, which, which Tom will be talking about in the next talk. So kind of acts as a bit of a precursor to Tom's talk in a way. So uh, I joined the Lancaster team in the 2000s, um, at mid 2000s, and at that time the university looked after quite a few distinct networks. Um, there was the usual networks to be expected of a university, the uh, campus network, residences network, wireless network and so on. Um, but we also looked after a couple of external WAN networks, namely Canal Man, uh, which was the Cumbria and North Lancashire MAN, and that was the regional uh, Janet MAN uh, connected higher educational establishments in the region. Um, and, and Clio, which was Cumbria and Lancashire Education Online, which uh, was the regional broadband consortium, and that connected schools, colleges, and local government sites um, to the national grid for learning and the internet. So um, we'll skip over that because we've got quite a lot of slides to get through. <laughs> it's just a couple of terms. Um, so uh, this is what Canaman looked like. Um, not so much of a network map, but it gives you a kind of an idea of some of the sites that we were connecting and, and the region. Um, so Canaman, as I say, connected HE, HE partners throughout Cumbria and Lancashire, buckled them to Janet. Um, initially, uh, Canaman also provided the upstream, well, Canaman did provide the upstream connectivity to Clio, which will form the rest of the talk, really. Um, so back in 96, most of the schools in the area were on ISDN, or quite a few of them had no connection whatsoever. And as a result of this, around 1996, 97, Barry had decided to form Ednet at the university, and that was to connect local schools via microwave at 2 meg um, from various pops around Lancaster back to the university and onward to Janet. Uh, in the end, around 12 sites, mostly high schools, uh, were connected in this way via Ednet. Separately, in 1999, uh, the government uh, launched an initiative to provide broadband uh, at 2 meg a second to, to all schools. Uh, and therefore, uh, Clio was formed. Um, so because of the experience of the university in the region, um, a three-way par partnership was formed between Lancashire County Council, Cumbria County Council, um, and the university. And as you can see uh, from the diagram, Clio was one, e one of many um, RBC networks throughout the country. Though we like to think we were a, a bit unique in, in the way we delivered it. So on the face of it, the university was then faced with quite a bit of a task. Um, Lancashire and Cumbria have some very difficult terrain, and particularly Cumbria, quite sparsely populated. And as you can see um, on here, the different population densities of the two areas. Um, and just overlaid on that, this is a map representing um, the sites we needed to connect. Um, at the beginning, in total, there's about 1,200 sites. Um, that gives you a good, good visualisation of the, the, the different densities of, of sites. Um, you see how sparse it is in Cumbria. So the initial phase, um, a, core, a core network, an ATM network was designed um, from which strategic aggregation sites would, would be formed um, and they'd be connected either via radio or, or, or LES circuits from, from the core sites. Um, and then from these aggregation sites, smaller lower bandwidth sites were connected um, either via, again, radio or, or EPS circuits via, via SDSL. And e EPS circuits, um, I'm sure everyone knows about these, but it's basically a copper pair between two sites via the exchange, but you didn't need a presence in the exchange in order to use them. Um, so the aggregation sites, because of, because of the line length, would be chosen so that the AN was as close to the exchange as possible just to keep the, the line length to a minimum. So up to around 2003, this is what the backbone looked like. It was a sort of a figure of eight for resilience. Um, it was a bit of terrestrial and a bit of, uh, a bit of fiber. Um, so the terrestrial was in, 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 in red and the microwave in green. Um, it was 155 ATM. And the core routing hardware at the time was Cisco 8510s at each of the pops. Um, it's an example fit out in one of the in one of the masts. So a couple of Ultium Ultium IDUs at the top there. That's your inbound and outbound link. Um, and then the Cisco router below that. Um, and then below that, there's some IDUs for the drop-off radios. Um, and that was what one of the drop-off radios looked like at the time. So that's a two 2.4 gig radio. Um, it was an Aries wavelength Aries, um, and that had about a 15 kilometer range with the right antenna on it. In 2003, so there was some trans-regional fibre procured, and that ran from Carlisle down to Warrington. Uh, and this provided the university itself with a link to, to Super Janet 4 um, down in Warrington, and as well as providing Clio with a new trunk fibre um, that, that could be added to the existing backbone. So that augmented the core somewhat, um, and, and that's how it looked once, once that fibre was brought into place. So 
fast forward to 2005 and the core routers were getting a bit long in the tooth at that point, um, having a few problems, so uh, procurement took place uh, for a new set of core routers, um, and that was at the time won by Juniper. We bought 33 new routers, M320s and M7Is, um, and at the time the addition of this kit allowed us to simplify the network configuration quite a lot, because for the first time we had layer 2 and layer 3 VPNs, and being a network where you've got different server farms in Cumbria and Lancashire, you had libraries on it, you had public sector sites on it, this, this for the first time we could properly, without using horrible PBRs and things, um, we could separate traffic out nicely. Uh, around the same time, we also swapped out a lot of our 2.4 gig drop-off radios for 5.8 gig radios. Uh, they were higher power um, and bandwidth, so you could get um, up to about 30 kilometers with those without a problem if there's no interference. Uh, unfortunately, there's still only four, four non-overlapping non channels, so if there's other operators around, um, you might have to do a bit of uh, talking between you to choose which channels you're using. So just a few pictures again. Uh, uh, the left-hand side there, that's uh, one of the sector antennas with a 5.8 gig radio. These are our variants. Um, the middle there, um, that's the form factor, the diamond shape of the point-to-point -point units and the subscribe units. Uh, obviously, there's some junipers on the right there. So fast forwarding again, 2004, brought along um, LLU um, and access to the telephone exchanges. So we immediately saw the benefit in that. Um, and a large number of sites uh, that we were connecting at the time were in reach of that exchange footprint. So 125 exchanges were unbundled. Uh, we started using MPF circuits, which, are, again, I'm sure a lot of you know, is a copper pair from the exchange to a site. Um, and over that, we ran SDSL um, at 2 meg, 2 meg a line, and, and ADSL 2, 2 and 2 plus for the longer lines. Uh, initially, the exchanges were kind of just treated as edge sites off of the existing core. Um, but eventually the exchanges started to take place at the existing core um, and aggregator sites and, and, and the feed direction kind of reversed. Um, and just to note, although, although MPFs are often hated these days, um, they were an awful lot better at the time than the EPS circuits they replaced because um, you, you have more of a leg to stand on when something went wrong. Um, so if you phoned up and said an EPS, uh, you know, if, as long as an EPS circuit could pass voice, um, the BT engineer was happy, whereas with MPF you've at least got a bit of a thin spec to stand up to. Um, so that's just a couple of pictures showing showing the uh, exchange exchange kit. Um, so there's a SD, uh, ADSL D slam there on the left. They were um, lucent stingers. It's actually a bit of a newer picture because it's got some of the newer FM kit at the top there. Uh, just some exchange patching on the right. Uh, so yeah, the final iteration of the network, at least that we were involved in, um, was dubbed Clio 2. That was a refresh of practically everything. Uh, new Amex varieties went in, um, in, in in a fewer number of core locations than the first iteration, so we had about six major core locations. And the exchange chains then formed a, a bit of a metro edge network, um, so it's more modern network design, really. Um, a new fibre route was also procured via Geo um, from Manchester down to Carlisle, and that allowed us to drop out wavelengths along the way. Um, we had some RAM and amplifiers on that, on, on the longer legs. Um, and yeah, that's just made me think of something. Once we uh, were doing a, a splice on that Raman amplified link and we forgot to uh, actually switch the Raman amplifier off. Now it's supposed to trip out when the, the link's cut, but it didn't for some reason. So we're there cleaning the fiber with, uh, with IPA uh, spirit as, as you do when you're doing splicing and uh, the amplifier was still on. So we got a nice flame shoot out the end of the fiber, which was uh, always interesting. We soon realized what was going on. Um, so this is a bit of a transitional map uh, with some of the new links in place, the Clear 2 links. Um, and just as a note on there, the standard links for the sites in Clio 2 was 100 meg for the secondary schools and, and 10 meg for primary schools, so there were some with, with different bandwidths. Um, this is a bit of a diagram with a bit more detail on it. Um, it's a bit of a low-res copy to kind of fit it on. Um, but And also because it's a, lot, a much closer representation of the current network, so um, I had to kind of blur it out a bit. But um, So the larger red squares on there are where the MX varieties are, and, and then you've got obviously the dual-connected exchange rings coming off that and a few, few dark fibre sites and masts as well still for the fill-in. So uh, 2008, we got some new SDSL equipment for higher higher, higher line rates. Um, Hatteras won that, so with an eight-line CPE at the time, the Hatteras could do five mega line, as you can get more now. But um, So that gave us up to 40 meg on, on short lines through, through, one, uh, through one CPE with eight lines. Uh, and until GEA came along uh, for FTTC, these would become the workhorse of the LOU network, and that connected most of the 10 meg sites where the line lengths were under about three kilometres. Uh, again, just some pictures of the Hatteras kit there. Um, so the one, each one UD slam on the left there would do 40 lines. Um, additional D slams could be stacked in. Uh, we tended to load balance the lines across the units so that, um, you know, for resilience and so that we could do maintenance on individual units without, without losing a site. 
Um, we also put some new DC equipment in, um, which just gives us better runtime in the core sites. I'll skip over that. Um, and a, a final microwave radio refresh, this was the third one. Um, we still needed microwave in Clio 2 because, like I say, some rural sites and, and, and you know the line lengths were just too long to do them over EFM. So um, we refreshed a B-band 5.4 kit for the majority of the radios, and this was really just to give us, because you know there was a lot more people by that point using 5.8 gig, so um, moving to 5.4 gave us more non-overlapping channels and we could work around interference a bit better. So that's uh, just an overview of the network. So. Um, as many rural broadband projects will know, good backhaul is often the hardest hardest part to source. So, uh, Clio, Clio provided black backhaul to um, quite a lot of existing uh, points of presence all over all over Clio land in Cumbria, Lancashire, and quite a lot of uh, rural broadband projects. Uh, in some cases, the university also got involved with the last mile delivery in the rural areas, such as Ray, um, where the university conducted projects into into mesh technology. Um, there's not really time to cover that today, but there's some links to slides on there, and, and Nick's here today from Lancaster Uni as well uh, down here. So have a chat with Nick if you're interested in the, in the research side of things. So um, I just wanted to finish off um, a few anecdotes and some pictures, really. So this was this was one one of the sites where uh, we desperately the site desperately needed a connection upgrade, um, but the backhaul for the exchange wasn't ready. So we thought no problem, we're, you know we're a telco, we'll drop a we'll drop a pole, we'll put a radio on top, we'll backhaul it over radio, that's fine. We thought so we put the pole in. Um, but there was no power for the cabinet that we put at the bottom of the pole. So we thought, no problem, we'll, we'll bodge something, we'll put a, well, bodge. Um, we'll put a wind generator on top of the pole um, and some batteries in the cabinet and that'll be, that'll be all fine um, to get there. And, and that worked and that was good, but um, one day ob the obvious happened and um, um, the internet went down at the site and, and we had to, uh, the site rung in and we had to ask them if it was windy and, and they got all stroppy. I don't see why that's relevant. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, ultimately um, they were fine. The, the, the fiber, the power, and the fiber eventually went in, and I think the uh, wind generator blew itself off the pole eventually and landed somewhere. So uh, another bit of a crazy one. Um, we used to have a change freeze over A-level results day, so obviously we connected a lot of secondary schools. So it was pretty annoying one day on A-level results day when a secondary school rang in and said they'd lost their connection. These, this, this was a site off of a mast. Um, so we roll out and we go to have a look at it and we find out when we get there there's a sheep in the compound and the fence is damaged and we think, oh no. Um, so we did a climb to, to test the cable and, and we found out it was broken in several places. And uh, on further inspection, it turns out the sheep's been nibbling it, which was a bit of an odd one. So um, well, what it really needed was a bit of deeper burying or some steel wire armor cable. So, but we, could, we, repaired, the, we repaired the cable and uh, got, it, got it all back up and running again. Um, but again, obviously, we had to call the site and explain to them what had happened. And, and that got translated as the sheep ate RA levels and ended up in the papers and all sorts. But I think they were eventually happy. Ah, yes, this one. Um, this was decomming one of the old SDH, um, SDH dishes. But it, it looked a lot smaller on the tower. And so we got a guy to bring this trailer along to pick it up once we got it down. Um, you can see it was a bit of a windy day there because the rope's going around in a big bow. Um, so that was the first problem. But yeah, so we got a guy to turn up with a trailer. <laughs> and uh, when we got the dish down, we realized uh, the trailer looked a bit silly. But it was strapped down. We managed to get it away from the site. So yes, it all ended OK. Um, and this one, there's not so much of a funny story about this one, but it's basically we were just trying to get a fiber across Carlisle city center. And the only way to really do it was to go across a bridge. But there was nowhere where we could really run the fiber over the top of the bridge without it being really accessible to people. So. Uh, we got to hang off the bridge on ropes, which was fun, and do a bit of rope access. Um, yeah, some interesting pops. So uh, one of the interesting pops up in Cumbria was Great Dunfer Radar Station, um, which is there. So we use that to get from, from Penrith. I don't know if I've got a laser thingy here. So Penrith there, and ooh, shaking all over the place. Penrith there, and Alston's there. So we, we, used, we used Great Dunfer radar, radar Station as a bit of a relay. Um, so we could use we could put radios on the uh, on the gantry around the middle bit here, uh, in order to uh, relay in and out. So yeah, that was quite an interesting site. It's right on top of the Pennines. You can just about see it on the top of that first picture there, um, up on top of this hill. Uh, we also had a pop on Winter Hill, which is where the major Northwest um, TV well one of the major Northwest TV transmitting stations is. Um, and that serves yeah, six, well over six million people. We weren't actually on the main guide tower. We were on one of these smaller towers down down on the left-hand side there. 
Um, that's where that one is. So I just thought I'd finish with some lessons learned. Um, so yeah, use DC power when possible. This is mainly for remote sites, but um, initially we did try to do things with AC, and I mean, sometimes there's a good reason not to, but um, we found once we had things on DC, um, you know, when you get a text on a Friday night just before you go home or over the weekend, and you can think, well, well you know, I've got a day or two to deal with this, or the power might come back, rather than thinking, oh, I've got to be there in two or three hours. Um, it, it's great. <laughs> Unfortunately, like I say, vendors know you're a telco, so the, the prices for DC kit tends to be higher. Um, I'm probably uh, talking to the converted here anyway. Um, always clean and scope fiber patches. Um, get them clean before you put them in. So that causes us no end of problems, especially with you know DWDM links and, and amplified links. Um, and you've really got to drum that into into the field teams. Um, and it can be a problem as well where where, where you're running into DCs and, and you're relying on others to patch things through ODS for you. You really need to, especially again with longer links, you need to make sure that they're doing the cleaning for you. Um, don't underestimate the sporting systems requirements. So, you know, with LLU and, and GEA, you've got an awful lot of, of things to track. Um, and the systems always end up taking longer to write than you expected them to. Um, and as much as management want to use spreadsheets, uh, it, it just it only works for so long. Um, MPFs, yeah, try and get a wet and tone or a dial tone on them because otherwise the pairs do get, um, the records don't tend to be good enough. And the first thing the BT engineer will do is go out and, and, and try and find a spare pair, and they'll do that by putting their checking for a dial tone or a, or a wetting current so um, it, otherwise your pairs will go walk about um, and I have a test head in the exchange or, or some handheld testers to verify problematic lines uh, outdoor radios make sure they're uh, well waterproofed because um, you know quite a lot of the time and, and use good cable because quite a lot of the time you, you get a nick in the cable up a tower and the water just runs straight down the cable inside the jacket and ends up uh, going all over your kit in the heart which is a bad day um, and yeah, unlicensed band radios, back in the beginning, we, we used a lot of um, you know, 90 and 120 degree uh, antennas on radios. Um, but these days, we're tending to have to use, if we're using unlicensed band, we have to use a lot more high gain antennas because uh, the bar's been lowered. There's a lot of, there's a lot of five gig kit, kit around now, so um, there's a lot more interference around. So yeah, you tend to have to use higher gain antennas. I think, I think that's it. So it's a bit of a rush through. Is there any questions? Do you have any questions for Robin? Did you do anything differently if you had to do it again? <laughs> <laughs> Loads of things. <laughs> um, it was, I mean, it was, to be honest, it was quite an interesting network to learn on, because similar to what the previous talk was talking about, um, not, not so much nowadays, actually, but in the earlier days, working on an educational network, you did get a little bit more leniency when, to, to make mistakes, uh, and, and we did make mistakes. Um, you know, these days, like you say, everyone expects the SLA, but um, so I, th I think we, learning, on the, learning on an educational network I thought was quite good at the time, and um, allowed a lot of the guys to, to, to work with the research department as well, and you know, testing things like V6 and multicast. Um, which on a production network you you wouldn't be able, you wouldn't be able to do so, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay.